Good day, everyone. Welcome to our next presentation for Queensland AXA. So exciting to have everyone here and so exciting to have Nadia with us. I'm just going to quickly go through um, some housekeeping um, and then we'll introduce Nadia. But first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge the country that we're all found on, <laughs> find ourselves on tonight. And um, I'm in the Waka Waka country. And I love this land and, you know, and I'd love to pay my respects to the traditional uh, custodians of this land and the land itself. So, yeah, hopefully you can feel that for yourself as well. And I'd like to wait, welcome you to another AXA um, webinar. And basically um, what we do is promote citizen science. So we really would like to encourage everyone to get involved and do some science, uh, citizen science, by just basically contributing to the various projects we present. And today is the Frog ID app presentation. So I would like everyone to be muted, and we will try and finish at eight. So we'll leave Nadia a little bit of time for questions. But uh, you know, we're going to try and sort of also. She's in New South Wales, so she's got a, a, an hour ahead of us. So it's pretty late for her. So we'd like to respect that. So we will keep the questions kind of succinct for tonight. Uh, and really, um, I'd like to introduce um, Nadia uh, Roslyn, and she's the project coordinator for Frog ID, and that's a uh, Australian museum app. Uh, it's a citizen science project actually that informs um, frog conservation by recording their calls. And this is where we as citizen scientists uh, get to participate in this amazing project. And Nadia will talk about just how important it is in terms of what's happening to frogs right now. So I'll hand over to Nadia. Thank you so much for being with us, Nadia, tonight. Really appreciate you being here and the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I'll pull up my slides and get going. Let's <clears throat> find it. Great. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I'm presenting on Gadigal and Bidjigal country uh, in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians um, of the land that I work, play and, and, and live on um, and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that you're tuning in from tonight as well. So I'm really excited. I can't see your faces at the moment. I've got my screen up, but... Um, um, looking forward to chatting with you after my presentation. Um, I'm really excited to share Frog ID with you today. It's a national citizen science project um, based at the Australian Museum in Sydney. And you may have already known that citizen science is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. It's when members of the public like you and I can contribute to scientific research, um, also known as community science. So today I'll share what the Frog ID project is all about, um, how the project is informing frog conservation, um, how it can be a tool for monitoring frogs in your backyard and your, your um, habitats around you, and how you, your family and friends can join us and thousands of others across the nation in frog conservation simply through your smartphone. <clears throat> So I would first like to acknowledge that I am presenting on, on behalf of a very big team at the Australian Museum Research Institute. I am the project coordinator, but I work with Dr. Jodie Rowley and a number of um, herpetologists at the Australian Museum. So many of the people on this screen are actually using Frog ID data to uh, inform gaps in, in, in frog research and conservation. And Many of them are also uh, Frog ID validators. So they listen to the recordings being submitted to the Frog ID project and help identify the frogs and contribute to our national database. So I'm presenting on behalf of a big team and really like to acknowledge that they've helped me a lot with these slides and producing amazing research with the Frog ID data. Uh, so a little bit about me. I started working in citizen science in tropical North Queensland. I studied zoology, uh, which is branch of uh, biology that studies animal kingdom um, and eventually my studies led me to uh, work in the tropics and citizen science on a rainforest biodiversity monitoring program led by Professor Stephen Williams and what this first job really showed me was the benefit of citizen science or the many benefits of citizen science 
So it showed me that getting out in nature was really good for our well-being. We all felt really amazing being outdoors and energized. Um, and second, I worked with a lot of people from around the world. So um, they, these people didn't necessarily have backgrounds in science at all, but um, they were really, really interested and, and, and felt really good about connecting uh, to real world science um, without needing a scientific background. And so it really showed me that citizen science was for everyone. And we were able to capture data on scales not traditionally possible with um, scientific methods uh, without the help of citizen science. So hopefully today you'll see whether you're a student, a mum, dad, grandpa, grandpa, ma, you, you can become a citizen science as well and um, help us save our threatened wildlife. So let's move on to the Australian Museum Research Institute. This is where I'm based um, uh, in Sydney. And we have uh, a few different citizen science projects at, the, at, at AMRI. Um, and Frog ID is our flagship citizen science project. But we've also got Digivol, which is an online digitization platform where you can embark on um, entomology or malacology collections and diaries of renowned zoologists from the 19th century and, and help transcribe those collections. And we've also got the Australasian Fishes Project uh, where you can help inform the uh, size and shape of different fishes in Australia and New Zealand. So we've got several, several different citizen science projects based at the Australian Museum and Frog ID is our flagship project that was uh, kicked off in 2017. <clears throat> so why do we create Frog ID? Um, it's, it's a question we get asked a lot and really for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is that um, globally, frogs are in a lot of trouble. So there are hundreds of species thought to be extinct across the globe and many others threatened with extinction. And when people think of endangered animals, they might think of really charismatic megafauna like tigers and rhinos. Um, but hopefully, after tonight, you and your friends can think about frogs more because they're actually very threatened and declining more rapidly than many vertebrate groups like birds and mammals. So <clears throat> in Australia, um, well, in, across the globe, there's about 42% of amphibians are threatened with extinction. And in Australia, we've already lost at least four species uh, to extinction, unfortunately. And then we have over 40 that are threatened with extinction. So it's really, really sad. They're really facing decline and they face a number of threats. Um, one major threat is disease. So the amphibian chytrid fungus is a really uh, a horrible disease that's affecting frog skin and frogs really depend on their skin to survive. They, um, their skin helps them drink. They drink through their skin, through their belly patches. Um, and they also um, yeah, need their skin to breathe and exchange gases. So the skin is a very important part and unfortunately this disease is taking hold of many species and what's caused the extinction of at least four in Australia. Like many other biodiversity, they're uh, facing habitat loss and degradation, pollution, they're very tied to um, aquatic environments, they need to be near water and are very sensitive to changes in that environment, so pollution plays a huge role in, in the decline. Uh, introduced species, so whether it's cats and dogs or even introduced pigs, really impact frogs by um, really ruining their sensitive habitat uh, that they need to breed. And the cane toad also competes with our native species by um, eating the pests, eating the species that, um, that they need to survive. Um, maybe not so much here, but the wildlife trade is also a very significant threat to frogs. And of course, climate change will have um, an exacerbating impact on all these existing stresses. So frogs unfortunately have a, a great deal of um, threats facing them. And we really want frogs to be around. Um, they play such an important role in our environment. They're actually very, very important bioindicators because they're very sensitive to environmental change. So when frogs are around, we know that the environment is healthy because you know, they're very sensitive to pollution and, and changes like that. So if frogs disappear, we know that something's not right. So they're very important bioindicators um, and they're very important to the food web. They keep everything going. They're like the glue that helps keep everything going because lots of other animals 
eat frogs. Um, they're a very nutritious uh, meal for many of our birds and, and reptiles. And so they help keep other animals um, nice and full and healthy. And tadpoles are really important. They help regulate algal blooms. So there, there are a lot of studies across uh, overseas um, showing that when, when frogs and tadpoles are removed from the environment, you actually get ecological collapse. So it's really bad news when frogs and tadpoles are removed from the environment, you get these algal blooms as well. <clears throat> Another reason, maybe more selfish, is that we want frogs to be around is because um, lots of the, the, the traits that we find in their skin, so their antifungal and antibacterial properties, are really, really important from advancing medical research. So um, the crucifix frog, which is uh, one of the frogs pictured down the bottom, um, lots of scientists are actually looking at the substance in the skin, this glue-like substance, which is really, really powerful, and they're thinking about using it for uh, things like surgery. And another reason we want our frogs to be around is because they're so unique. They're so special. They're found nowhere else in the world. So we really don't want to lose these amazing animals that occur nowhere else. So Frog ID, I mentioned, started in 2017. And this is a map of all the records um, that has been submitted to the all the frog records that have been gathered through the Frog ID project. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's very much concentrated to where people live. It's, like all citizen science projects, it's kind of where people are, are based that we get lots of data. Um, and if you zoom in a bit more, so for example, where I am in around Sydney, you can still see that there are still many parts of Australia where we don't have scientific records of frogs at all. So this is real, this is a real barrier to frog conservation and one of the biggest barriers to frog conservation because um, we really need to understand where species are if we are to better protect them. So that is one of the biggest reasons why we started Frog ID as well, because we don't know much about them. Um, the simple understanding of where they are is what we need to start off with first. Uh, and frogs and amphibians have been badged amongst vertebrates as being the most, most threatened and poorest known group. So we need to understand where frogs are to better conserve them. And we're still discovering species. So uh, at least 14 frog species have been described in the last decade and three in 2016. And in fact, in the last year, we had about three also newly described to science. Um, and some of these were thanks in part to frog ID recordings. <clears throat> One of the frogs that was uh, recently described in the last decade was this beautiful Cape York graceful tree frog, very special frog to our project because it features on our, on our logo sometimes. Um, this is one species that our lead scientist, Dr. Jodie Rowley, co-described in the North, um, North Queensland wet tropics. So a very special species that's newly added to our list of frogs. More recently, we've had um, species like the Southern Heath frog uh, added to science. And that was also thanks in part to frog ID recordings, looking at their calls and the subtle differences in their calls to help describe them. <clears throat> but we started Frog ID because of this fact as well, which is that every species of frog makes a unique call. And by listening to their call, we can understand what species they are. So it's essentially very, um, I guess, making it easy for scientists to understand what species it is without even seeing this, the frog at all or disturbing its habitat just by listening to its call. And that call you're hearing is actually a male frog singing out to attract female frogs. So um, they really don't want to get it wrong. That's going to be a waste of everyone's energy if they do. So they want to call out to their specific species. So every species of frog in Australia makes a unique call. The next few slides um, are some of my colleagues' slides that show the amazing diverse calls that frogs can make. So I'll show you um, a few from around Australia just to show you how different frog calls can sound. So this is the striped rocket frog, Litoria nasuta. I'll just check that you can hear that. Can someone give me a yell? <coughs> Loud and clear. Okay, great. Is that, that like a duck? 
We've got now a different species of frog that's um, from northern parts of Australia, so the northern spadefoot. I think this is one of the coolest sounding frogs in Australia. <coughs> Sounds like an owl. <laughs> And then the last example I will share is the graceful tree frog, which is again very different, also from northern parts of Australia. So frogs can really vary in their calls, and um, it's really, really great to identify frogs by their call. Um, and just to illustrate this, are two very similar looking species, the Barrington Tops tree frog and the green string frog. And even biologists have them in the hand, find it really tricky to identify these two different species. They do sometimes call it like they, they're just so identical, it's very hard. Um, so you can look at the, the, the uh, spectrogram down below this frog and you can see how different they are. But I'll just try and play it for you as well. That's the Barrington Tops tree frog, and this is the green string frog. Very, very different. So by making all these different noises, frogs are revealing what species they are, and sometimes it's much more accurate, or most of the time it's more accurate to understand what species it is by its call. Uh, so next I'll go into why we started um, Frog ID. It's the people power. So we really wanted to capture this data on a large scale because there were so many data gaps to fill. And so we needed a community involved. So we, we built this app. And the app is actually um, a really uh, bespoke piece of technology. It's it's actually a field guide um, to Australia's frogs and it's the most up-to-date field guide you will have to Australia's frogs because we, we update the information when new research becomes available constantly. Uh, but its main function is to record frog calls. So with the app, you can um, look at the different species um, listed in Australia. You can go into their different profiles. You can look at when they're calling, their description. You can even play their calls and you can learn more about them, like the habitats they use, and maybe those habitats are on your property, and also similar looking species. So it's a really handy free field guide to Australia's frogs, but um, its main function is to record frog calls. So if you hear a frog in your backyard or when you're on a bushwalk, um, whether it's one single frog or a loud chorus of frogs, we would love you to record it with the frog idea. And the way you would do this is simply pull out the app. Um, you can register your account and you can start recording. So the main button that will pop up is the red record button. And you press that and record for at least 20 seconds, up to a minute. But as long as that frog's advertisement call is within that 20 seconds, even if it's not throughout the whole duration, uh, that is enough information for our scientists to then um, listen to it and identify the species. So after you've recorded, you're taken to a filter screen where you can select uh, what habitat and water body is most suited to the area that you're in. You can also skip that step as well. You can also test your ID skills, so matching the calls with the recording that you just made. Uh, but again, you can also skip this step. It's not essential that you know any frog calls at all to participate in Frog ID. Um, you can simply submit it to our team. But it's a real, real nice way to test your skills and become uh, a frog call expert as well. Once you've made a recording, it's a good idea to check your folders regularly on the Frog ID app, but also on the Frog ID website where there's more information. So this is where you'll see all the verified frogs from um, that have been uh, assessed by our team and confirmed. Uh, and then you can also just check if there's anything that's not submitted yet, because sometimes in remote areas, your recording may not submit automatically. So you might need to open the app back up when you're in mobile coverage again and, and help push it along. 
Uh, this is to show you what it looks like on the website. So when I log into my Frog ID profile um, at, on the website, um, these are new features that we've recently released. This is where you can look at a summary of your Frog ID profile. So for example, I've submitted over 300 recordings um, and out of those recordings, I've verified um, about 200 frogs and 28 different species. So the circle that is on the left is showing where I can also share my profile if I want to. And that's only if you make your profile public, you can also make it private if you like. Um, on the right is showing my capture screen. So I've clicked on my captures and what's circled there is where I can export all of my captures. So in a spreadsheet, um, you can look at all the captures you've made through the Frog ID project. And on this page, you can look at anything that's pending. And this is also where you can download your audio files really easily. Also on this new web, profile feature, um, you can click on badges and you can find all the Frog ID badges that we've released and um, work your way up to them. So the more you record with Frog ID, the more badges you can earn. I am currently trying very hard to get the Australia wide badge. I really want that badge one day. Uh, this is what it looks like on the other side. So when it comes into our database, our Frog call experts will listen to that recording and this is what they see. Uh, it's at least one or sometimes even a few different frog call experts that need to review every submission, especially if it's a threatened frog species. We really want to make sure we're um, accurately identifying that for you. Um, and the beauty of Frog ID is that the app automatically applies all the information automatic. So we, we really want people to use the app because it lets us know the timestamp, the geolocation, and the GPS accuracy. And this GPS accuracy is really important because devices vary in their um, capabilities. And so we don't want to use um, records that are, for example, over three kilometers out um, for threatened species assessments. So this is great that it auto automatically applies all the information we need. Um, so the next little bit, I'll share what the Frog ID database is telling us. So through all of these citizen science recordings, um, which is in the thousands, um, what are we actually finding out for frog research and conservation? So since 2017, Frog ID has gone up pretty gangbusters. Um, we've had over 24,000 people submit an audio um, and out of these uh, 470,000 recordings, we have verified over 740,000 frogs. And this is because some recordings um, have more than one species. I think the average is about um, just under three, uh, but our record for one single recording is about 13 different frog species. And that's pretty incredible and really fun to try and identify them all. Uh, so out of those recordings, we have counted at least 210 species in our database. And this equates to about 85% of the known frog species in Australia. So that's such a great continental coverage of Australia's frogs, thanks to people power. Thanks to people out there eavesdropping on frogs. Uh, this is our top 20 species. So um, the Crinia signifera, the common eastern froglet pictured here. This is our most recorded species and it sounds like a cricket. So if you if you are new to frog ID and you think you sound, um, think you hear a cricket, it might actually be uh, a frog. So do pull out the frog ID app and record it and submit it and test your skills. Um, so it's our most recorded species, but common species are really important to record as well. And every day if possible, because every record is helping fill these data gaps. And even if it's the same frog at the same pond each day, we would love to hear it. Sorry. Um, so I will go into a few of the scientific studies now and what Frog ID is telling us. Uh, the first example is of our iconic green tree frog. Um, frog ID actually provided the first data that the iconic 
green tree frog had almost disappeared from Sydney. Um, it used to be really, really common. Um, and it's one of Australia's most recognisable uh, frogs. So um, people were really noticing that when they weren't around. So we had a lot of anecdotal evidence that green tree frogs were in decline in Sydney, but we didn't have enough data to really show that they were. And it wasn't until Frog ID came along that um, we sadly had enough evidence to show that it was, um, it was in decline. And sadly, green tree frogs are being reported in a lot of sick and um, dead frogs across Australia, and I'll go into that a bit later. So Frog ID is really telling us about disappearing frogs. It's also telling us about threatened species. So lots of people on the ground, lots of groups like the Sloan's Champions and the Coranda Tree Frog um, group up in North Queensland, they're using Frog ID and really revolutionizing threatened species records. So they've um, over doubled the amount of scientific records for this species, helping us understand what this species needs, what habitat it needs to breed, and actually discovering species like the Sloan's froglet, for example, on the border of Aubrey in Victoria and New South Wales, it actually uh, needs um, a lot more um, care because it's actually really specialised in these different, in this little pocket of area. Um, so that's really great that Frog ID is increasing the number of records available for, for conservation of these threatened species. But also introduced species. So we also gather records of the introduced cane toad. And this is really important because um, we want to know where the cane toad is establishing and breeding. And actually Frog ID is um, recording the cane toad from areas where it previously wasn't known to be established. So it's like acting as like a early warning signal um, for the introduced species, um, but also um, other species like the um, that might come in from overseas. So um, it really is a way to monitor introduced species. And not just overseas species, but also native species, which are hitchhiking to other states. So Frog ID is also letting us know when um, populations of native species, such as the Eastern Dwarf Tree Frog is establishing elsewhere. And um, for example, in Melbourne, there's a population of this species. They're not normally found there. And this might be because um, they're being transported by nursery plants or, or produce. Uh, so they're breeding very well there and also in parts of Canberra. So Frog ID is really improving our understanding of where these species are now establishing populations and, and what that might mean to uh, frogs native to that area. Um, one of our students, Gracie Liu, his, has been working on frog ID data and looking at how frogs are responding to human modified spaces. So um, when humans come along, they really change the landscape so dramatically, um, creating roads and, and farms and, and mines, for example. So habitat modification is, is, a really, is really one of the greatest threats to frogs and other animals, and it's important to understand how they're responding. And so previous to Frog ID, this was really lacking for frogs, um, but now um, we have the data and, and Gracie's taking a really good look at this. And alarmingly, she found that 70% of frogs studied were intolerant of human modified habitats. So that means they were um, coping well living in, in, in these greener urban spaces and, um, and there are really some species that were at risk of decline. So what she found was that species that laid their eggs on land were almost um, amongst the most uh, intolerant and um, the future of these frogs would really depend on our ability to preserve their natural habitats. But she did find that some species are thriving. So the stri striped marsh frog, for example, is, is actually really thriving in urban environments um, and actually um, doesn't really mind that it lives near human modified spaces. Um, also the species um, that like human modified areas are the white lipped tree frog and the motorbike frog. So they're the, our top three that are tolerant of the human world. Frog ID is also informing uh, environmental recovery. So the devastating bush fires that happened in 2019 and 2020, um, so lots of conservation biologists really needed to get out there immediately after the fire, but they couldn't because of COVID lockdowns and things like that, and it wasn't safe to travel. 
um, and essentially losing that gap um, of knowledge. But fortunately, lots of people were out there still recording frogs with the Frog ID app. And this is a really important piece of research um, that the team has been building thanks to citizen science. Um, so before the fires, um, over, I think it was over 40 different species were recorded from the burnt habitat. And all of these species were heard calling immediately after in the first 125 days. Um, so that's really good news and probably one of the rare good news uh, stories following the Black Summer fires. Um, but unfortunately, we have to really continue the use of Frog ID to understand how they are persisting in the long term. So it gives us a little bit of hope, but um, yeah, with the power of citizen science, we can understand if they're really, really um, uh, responding fine after fire. More recently, uh, our, uh, one of our um, herpetologists, Tim Katea, he has been working on all the frog ID data to improve their distribution maps. So um, here is the, I think it's the red tree frog that is pictured here. Um, <clears throat> previous to the Australian Frog Atlas, which we released um, this year, there was the um, Global Amphibian Atlas of 2004. And that map was um, very um, coarse uh, and not fine scale, and it was very much out of date. Uh, so we used the thousands of frog ID uh, records to update all of these maps. And you can see comparing 2004 to that 2022 down the bottom um, that we have a more accurate understanding of the distribution of frogs thanks to citizen science. Um, and that's just people recording frog calls for a minimum of 20 seconds. We're able to produce these maps and we really want these maps used for conservation purposes. So they're now uh, open access and downloadable for anyone, whether you're a land manager, um, a conservation biologist, or whether you're just a nature enthusiast, you can also access these maps online and, um, and use Google Earth, for example, to see what species are around you. The Australian Frog Atlas also includes our most detailed look yet at how amphibian uh, species richness is distribu distributed across Australia. So this is kind of like a, a heat map of species richness and um, it shows, for example, that um, 45 frog species co-occur in the wet tropics of Queensland, which is a really, really um, high species richness. Um, conversely, uh, there are two areas where frogs have never been scientifically recorded, those white patches um, in the Simpson Desert and the Nullarbor. Um, and they may really be absent there, but there is a chance that some frogs are there. So if you are um, happen to travel there one day and 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 stop by after some rain, keep an ear out for frogs and 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 record any with the Frog ID app because that's some really valuable data to inform uh, where species are and species richness across Australia. A more of Gracie's research looking at urbanization. Um, Gracie looked at um, how frogs were responding to um, um, human modified spaces and how they're altering their breeding. And what she found was that frogs are actually breeding earlier uh, in urban, urbanized areas and also for longer. So this sounds like it might be good for the frogs. They're, they're breeding longer, they might have more successful um, you know, breeding seasons but we actually don't know if all this energy that they're spending on breeding more and, and, and breeding longer is actually having a positive impact or not. So it really opens an, uh, another suite of questions, um, but through Frog ID, we can hopefully understand if their populations are changing um, with urbanization over time. Um, and I've got this graph up again, because one of the recent papers that Tim produced um, with our colleagues is that frog ID records are actually really, really reliable in um, understanding cryptic frog species. So I mentioned these two species earlier, how they're very similar in appearance. Um, and what Tim showed was that the acoustic records that we're gathering from frog ID is actually um, a, a accumulating scientific records of frogs 17 times higher 
at a rate 17 times higher than non-acoustic records. So this um, way of recording frog calls is actually much better than using images alone. Just in recent weeks, we had another paper produced by the Frog ID team, and this is actually the 13th scientific publication using Frog ID data. Um, and that was understanding what uh, triggers frog breeding season. So what frogs um, really use to understand when they uh, want, to, want to breed. So looking at a macro scale um, using the continental frog ID data set. Um, so how do frogs know when to breed really? And so what Maureen looked at was different um, environmental traits um, like weather, day of year, um, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, all these different things. And what she found was that day of year was actually the most strongest driver of what cues frogs to breed. And that's really interesting because most of the time it's temperature or humidity, but this time it was day of year. Um, and also uh, rainfall in the past 10 days plays a part as well. So this information is really important for conservation biologists who want to survey frogs, um, but also really good baseline information that can be used to understand um, if this is shifting over time with climate change, for example. Uh, Frog ID is also discovering new species. So um, this is the screaming tree frog and some of you may be very thankful that I'm not playing the call, um, but it's a very piercing sounding frog. And uh, it actually was previously thought to be the bleating tree frog, Littoria dentata, um, which is up your way in Queensland. And so um, what Frog ID records really helped with was showing the subtle differences in Littoria dentata's call. So it was once thought to be um, one species, but now it's three different species. And the screaming tree frog is one of those new species. So this um, tree frog is actually found closer to me um, and then goes all the way up to Taree in New South Wales. And then north of that is the bleating tree frog. Um, so by using the Frog ID app, you could actually help discover new species. And this is already being shown and um, by several species in the last year. Another way that Frog ID is actually being a powerful force in frog conservation is by the reports we're receiving from Frog ID participants and, and, and other people on sick and dead frogs across Australia. Um, so this started happening in winter of 2021 and iconic um, green tree frogs, for example, were really dropping dead and it was really, really alarming. So our team working with the Australian Registry of Wildlife Health was um, going around and collecting specimens in New South Wales to try and understand the scale and, and cause of this awful mortality event. Um, disease is the number one suspect at the moment. I mentioned amphibian chytrid fungus, and they do know that it is playing a part, but um, it's not the whole story. So watch this space because our team is working really hard to understand why frogs are showing up dead and, and dying across Australia. And, um, and it wasn't, um, it was without citizen scientists um, letting us know about the frogs they're seeing dead, were we able to understand the uh, scale of this event. And also people collecting frogs and putting them in their freezer and popping them next to their peas um, and waiting for us to come around to collect them so that we could test them. That's been an incredible feat and um, uh, illustration of the power of citizen science informing this horrible mortality event. So I apologize, these images are really alarming, but if you do find any sick or dead frogs, um, most of the time they're out in the daytime, they're uh, slow, they're lethargic, they have reddened skin, reddish skin, um, that's sometimes mottled brown, and it's quite patchy, like it, they're peeling their skin, um, and they're often out in the day when they normally wouldn't be. So they just look really ill when you see them, and they do deteriorate very rapidly. If you do see them, take a photo and get in touch with us by emailing the calls at frogid.net.au. 
uh, email address and we can direct you to some people in your area that are helping with the mortality event. So that's um, me summing up what Frog ID is telling us. It's all these amazing things thanks to the power of citizen science and in just a matter of five years. And it's producing some really amazing research that uh, is available on our Frog ID website on our science page. So do read our blogs if you're interested and um, you can delve deeper into our scientific papers and also the Australian Frog Atlas if you want as well. Oh, that's the page there. So do hop on our science page um, where we have all of our recent blogs and um, scientific papers. Oh, so next I thought I'd share some of the top recorded frogs across the nation, um, just the top five or six species, um, and also share where you can find this on the Frog ID website and explore yourself. So Frog ID uh, has a map on its um, explore page and it shows all the records that um, have been um, uh, submitted to the Frog ID project. But on the public facing map, however, we buffer all the um, records. So that's in relation to um, honoring the privacy policy and also threatened species, um, the unique locations and precise locations of those threatened species will not be displayed because we do want to protect those species. Um, however, the frog ID records are going to conservation repositories where they're needed. So for instance, government bodies who use the state wildlife atlases like uh, Bionet in New South Wales or Wildnet in Queensland, um, we submit records to those platforms every year um, where the pre precise uh, information can be used for conservation and land use de decisions. So every frog ID record is um, being pushed to where it's needed for frogs to be considered in, in those decisions more. So on the Frog ID website, you can hop on the explore page and you can look at a list of the top species. And you can also uh, click on the LGA section and, and look at your local government area. Um, our top recorded species is the common eastern froglet I mentioned. It sounds like a cricket. So this species will breed most parts of the year and it's really not fussed about its environment. It will, it will really breed in, in little muddy drainage areas, um, in ponds, um, and even in snow, we've heard them calling uh, in the snowy mountains. So um, do keep an ear out wherever you are across Australia, um, or the eastern parts of Australia at least, to record this common species. Uh, the next is the striped marsh frog. So this is the species that Gracie found was most in, uh, so most tolerant of human modified spaces. So it's really not fussed about living amongst humans and actually thrives in polluted areas. Um, so this species sounds similar to a wet tennis ball being hit. It might be a bit soft and if so, Hop on the Frog ID app and have a listen, but it, it's also um, likened to popcorn when there's a whole chorus of striped marsh frogs calling. So they're calling at the moment um, and will be throughout uh, the rest of spring and summer. Our third most recorded species is the Perrin's tree frog. Um, so this species has a distinct cross-shaped pupil and beautiful um, bright colors in its legs and armpits. Um, but it does look very similar to the Tyler's tree frog, and so um, they do co-occur. So the only way to really tell them apart is by their call, and this is what the parent's tree frog sounds like. It's been described as having a maniacal cackle or a, a really laughing call. Next, we have the Eastern Dwarf Tree Frog, the Littoria phallax, which is one of our smallest tree frogs, the size of your thumbnail. Um, and it's calling at the moment, and it's the one that's been hopping over to Victoria and Canberra, establishing populations there where it's normally not distributed. They have a really lovely ratchet call.
that rig pip pip. My colleagues tell me that the rig part is to attract the female and the pip pip is to tell the male frogs off. And then the last frog species I'll share is the spotted marsh frog, which um, is, it sounds like a, kind of like a machine gun in, in, some, in some areas. So there are top five or six species um, and they're found in, in Queensland as well, if that's where you're based. Um, so we do want records of common species, but also, you know, the more threatened species. So um, if you are on a bushwalk and in more regional areas, do ensure you've got the frog ID app handy. Oh, I do have one more. Uh, this is Crinia parent signifera, so the Eastern sign bearing froglet froglet, which looks very similar to the common eastern froglet. Um, so its call is very important, but I seem to have missed the audio file here, um, but it sounds um, a bit more drawn out than the common eastern froglet. And our iconic green tree frog. Really sad that this frog is now um, in decline around Sydney. I wish I could hear that call at night. <laughs> so I thought I'd go into some slides to um, talk about how we can help our frogs out. Um, and well, I'm just going to keep an eye on the time. All right. Um, I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, a few things we can do at home is um, things like reducing our use of pesticides and, and chemicals because we've talked about how frogs are really sensitive to their environment. They're essentially like these um, hopping agar plates and picking up everything around them. So we really don't want to use a lot of chemicals if we can. Also making sure that our tires are clean before going into frog habitat, for example, when we're going camping and our boots, making sure that they're clean, clear or clear of any muck and also dry, and we can use some um, diluted bleach, bleach solution to clean them. Keeping our domestic pets indoors helps frogs out for sure. And, oh, and then I wanted to go into another way that you can help the project, which is Frog Idea Week. Um, let me just go back. Sorry, it's just stalled on me here. <laughs> just have to restart the PowerPoint, sorry. That's fine, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's just stuck and now it wants to restart. One moment. It's okay. Mm -hmm. If anyone else, while we're, while we're here, has any um, questions, please put them in the chat. I know Nadia is coming almost to the end of her presentation. I have about five or six for you already, Nadia. So oh, great. if there's any more, please keep popping them in the chat. That's been fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wrapping up. I'll just go to the slide I was up to. Great. And now share screen. You are sharing screen, just have to find the right page. You share. That should have a slide up now. Yep. Uh, if you just yeah. want to find where or on the front slide. Front slide. Does it say Frog ID Week? Uh, yes, yes, sorry, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. good. Wonderful. Um, gosh, it's not. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So, Frog ID Week is one way that you can take part in frog conservation. It's our annual audio snapshot or audio shot of frogs calling across Australia. Um, and it's um, really 
changing the game for frog conservation because we're getting this annual idea of how frogs are doing across the nation and building this year on year data set is really important to understand trends and if anything is changing over time. <clears throat> um, so last frog ID week, that slide isn't changing, is it? Sorry, I'll just yeah, it's staying. staying. It's staying. It's staying. Yeah, sorry about that. It's all right. I'll give one more go. If not, I'll just talk. Some of those frogs you've mentioned, Nadia, I definitely see see at my place. I have yeah. this little like a weed drowning <laughs> uh, bucket thing, and there's two of the. Um, striped rocket frogs living in there and calling during the day and I've got photos of them and they're adorable they just fly they're like a little you know pontoon oh that's awesome day. so cool okay last go if not I'll just talk <clears throat> all good all right. so frog ID week last year was one of our biggest events yet and we'd really love this year to be the same if not more but you can see that huge spike in the graph that was frog ID week it was crazy um, where we recorded over um, 37,000 records of frogs. And all this sounds really great. It's like big numbers, great, lots of records for frogs, but we want more. We really want more. We want every day at the same pond, even if it's the same frog, because um, that's a record that's helping fill data gaps and putting more frogs up on the map. So do record as often as you can, um, if not every day, every week or every month. Um, so Frog Idea Week is also a chance to increase our spatial coverage of the project. So this year we're really focusing on areas that don't have Frog ID records. And that is actually these um, local government areas here. Um, so if you're in re more remote areas in Queensland um, later this month or next month, we'd really love you to use Frog ID and help fill those data gaps. Uh, Frog ID Week in previous years was really important in um, helping inform bushfire recovery, um, but also the sick frogs that uh, were reported last year. And this year, it's not those. Um, it's not saying that those events aren't important anymore. The ongoing Frog ID data set will continue to help inform these horrible events, but this year will also um, um, help focus on stream frogs and if you do find yourself near a stream or creek we'd love you to record frogs around there um, and this will help our partners um, in the department of environment and, and the water group here use frog id data to help understand how stream frogs are doing uh, this slide was really just to show that we're getting recognized by the government um, it's really being used in areas where it's needed so through participating in Frog ID citizen science, you really are making a difference to frog conservation and biodiversity conservation in general. We do submit our records to ALA and the Atlas of Living Australia to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility as well, um, and also every state atlas across Australia. So it's really being used where it's needed um, and um, being used internationally as well. Uh, one new thing we're working on this week, um, hopefully by Friday, is this new frog song album that we're working on with um, the Bowbird Collective. So I'm not sure some of you may have seen that last year they released Songs of Disappearance for Birds. Um, actually, this year they're focusing on frogs and using a lot of the recordings submitted by citizen scientists on this CD album. So do keep an eye out for that frog song album, Songs of Dis Disappearance, and do purchase an album if you can. It's approaching Christmas time, so maybe you have uh, a nature enthusiast in your family that you might want to buy this for, but proceeds do go towards the Frog ID project, help us keep the technology running and help us keep it going to continue to uh, inform frog conservation. So wrapping up now, how to take part, download the free Frog ID app, register a free account, uh, preferably on the website. Use the Near Me filter to learn about your local frogs. You can learn about what habitats they use and see if you've got those habitats on your property. Then you can visit your local ha frog habitat, whether that's a pond, a dam, or um, even your storm water drains. Some frogs hang out there. Um, and usually at dusk or early evening or after rain is when frogs are most active. So record and submit calls as often as you can and do get in touch with us anytime you have trouble with the app. Um, we do recognize that some devices don't like um, 
newer apps. So it's really um, about troubleshooting those together. So get in touch with us anytime. We're happy to help. And that's it from me. I'm happy to answer questions uh, from you guys. Sorry about the technical glitches. No worries. Thank you so much, Nadia. That was so informative. Just loved it. I love the app. It's addictive. So I encourage everyone to use it. It's really fun. And you get to learn frog um, names as well and start to recognize the, the calls, which is really fun once you get it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I do have some questions for you from our audience. And the first one from Janine was, um, can we pick up frogs with our, with our bare hands? It's is not it okay recommended. To do that? Yeah. So the beauty of the Frog ID app is that you can monitor frogs without needing to see them or disturbing them and disturbing their habitat because frogs are very sensitive. So unless you have to move them from um, some danger, like your cat, for example, um, it's okay if you have clean hands and it's very brief, but uh, we wouldn't recommend handling frogs at all. Yes, because they do have that sensitive skin. I agree. Uh, the Barrington tops and the green um, stream frogs, are they actually closely related? Because their calls sounded also similar to... Yeah, I'm not um, familiar with the taxonomy. They, um, they might be closely related. There are about five different stream frogs in Australia that do occur in different areas, but they could be um, more related genetically. I'm not too sure, but um, they are very distinct species and you can tell by their call. Mm -hmm. And um, Eric asks, um, can I use um, the app in Indonesia or is it limited to Australia? It's limited to Australia because um, our frog call experts are, are experts in Australian frogs. So um, we don't have a, a team that um, knows all the frog calls in Indonesia and other countries. We are Australia focused, but um, if you do hear of any opportunities for it to be expanded, we're open to discussion because we would love Frog Idea to expand internationally, but it takes a lot of resources and a lot of expertise because it's not machine learning. It's um, it's real humans on the other side listening to those recordings. Yeah, yeah, it'd be lovely. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear frogs from all over the world on the app? Oh, lovely, <laughs> yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> um, I had a question about um, how to upload pending and not submitted calls. I've got an app iPhone and I'm finding it a struggle once that happens when there's no connection. I don't know then how to upload them. Is there a way to do that? Yeah, so if it has been submitted but pending upload, uh, you might need to, um, this sometimes happen in remote areas or when you don't have strong mobile coverage. When that happens, um, it's good to open the Frog ID app, log out and log back in and see if it pushes itself along. Um, but unfortunately, some devices struggle to connect to the server, um, especially if they're older devices. So sometimes some calls can get stuck. So let us know if you do experience that. And it's good to know, um, to let us know your device model and what software version you have um, so we can report it to our app developer. Awesome, thank you so much, I'll do that. Um, the next question is by Louise. If green tree frogs are declining in Sydney, is that the same for other regions, example, Brisbane and other cities? We don't know. What We certainly got the data set to look at it. It's just a matter of um, for our research team or someone else to use frog ID data to look at that. Um, but I don't think we've had reports of green tree frogs in decline around there, but um, I might not be um, privy to all that. So um, potentially we do have the um, records to do that analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, I've asked a question about do frog species migrate due to climate change? Have you seen that yet? Has that been looked at? Um, so the rainforest biologist I, I first worked with, Professor Stephen Williams, um, he is looking at rainforest specialists in the wet tropics and um, he has shown that a number of species, um, not just frogs, but birds as well and mammals, are moving upslope due to climate change because they're tracking cooler temperatures. So this is quite worrying because um, in just, you know, a small change in average uh, temperature increase, we're seeing species move. Um, and uh, essentially they'll have nowhere else to go because they'll be pushed up the mountain slope where they'll have no more habitat left. So climate change mm. is a big, big issue for those 
threatened species um, that occur nowhere else in the world that uh, live on mountaintops. So it is happening, yes, unfortunately. Um, and you can look at Professor Stephen Williams's research for more on that. Mm, it's very sad, yeah. Um, Louise asked a more colourful question. I love the names given to frogs by their call, but can they be named after people too? <laughs> So yes, they can be named after people. And I guess I'm not a taxonomist, but if you do describe a species, you get to name it. Um, and some recent species have been named after um, quite um, renowned people in, in the herpetology world. So um, one of our research associates, um, Dr. Marion Anstis, uh, she's a, a frog expert and our two species were actually named after her, well, because they're two species in the same genus. And the new genus is actually Anstisia. So that's quite nice. And um, mm. Dr. Jodie Rowley has also named a frog um, from her studies in, in her research in Southeast Asia after her mum. Mm. Nice. Be lovely to have a frog named after <laughs> yourself. <laughs> um. Louise also asks, have you seen any green tree frogs get a blue color to, to them? Example, I have a theory, like what happens when you put scorpions under an infrared light? You do get um, examples of green tree frogs with blue skin, and that's simply because they're lacking some of the pigment that, um, that produces green. Um, so I think it's the yellow pigment that they're lacking, and so they appear blue to us. Um, mm. And actually, the scientific name is Cerulea because one of the specimens, early specimens that helped describe this frog was actually blue. Um, so that's why it was called Cerulea because that means blue. But yeah, they're actually green in, mm. when they're alive. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a, um, a phosphorescent frog. I should say I didn't know it was phosphorescent, but when the light uh, by accident in the um, in the Amazon, someone shone a light, you know, a UV light, and the frog was phosphorescent, like it, it glowed in the dark. Yeah, I'm so not aware cool. of any, <laughs> but there probably are amazing glow-in-the-dark frogs, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, the other, I think I had a question also about um, the disease or the uh, death, what's it called? The um, Hitred fungus more so to do with the you know the color changes and how they die and come out is that related to the fungus or is there more many more kind of causes to make them um, experience the horrible death that you know that happens to frogs there are lots of other things that it could be there's parasites there's lots of other diseases and viruses um whether it's a new thing um our team of researchers are working with others across australia to find out yeah mm. And that's only been, like, when did that start? Is that something that has been going on for a while? Like, do you know exactly, like, when? Last winter. And so the research will be, it's, it's being looked at. So it's really right now that they're looking and, and sampling all those frogs, thanks to people, um, citizen scientists. So it really wouldn't be possible without their help. Mm. I feel like I've seen cane toads have that happen to them at my place. Yeah, frogs, so, um, including yeah. cane toads, are affected. So yeah, we are yeah. collecting cane toads as well. Yeah, so this is all of our questions, I think. Is that right, guys? I'm just looking down. Anything else? We thank you so much, Nadia. That was so informative. And I really hope people start, um, well, we already have a large group of people. Uh, and in the poll, I think, what was the results for our poll? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I totally forgot about the poll. <laughs> yeah, so we've got 59% already users and 41% okay. are newbies. So we encourage yeah, you, you 41, 39 That's guys. Great. To, uh, I hope to I shared some using. information of how existing users, how their records are making an impact and getting excited for Frog ID Week. <laughs> yes, that is just super exciting. Thank you so much. And I would like to invite everyone to answer a survey um, that we'll send out as well because we would love to hear about your feedback um, that you have for us and that always informs our next presentation and it's always great to have that um, feedback from you guys Nadia thank you so much for staying up late with us tonight and <laughs> it's been a me. great pleasure having you yeah always no wonderful to have you, thank you. <laughs> all right well if anyone is everyone is happy to to uh, close up tonight thank you so much for being here
Uh, thanks for um, yeah participating live, which is so good. And of course, the recording will be shared online as well. Uh, so on the AXA YouTube channel. So please also um, inform yourself more and tell your friends about it so they can inform themselves as, about frogs too. See you, Nadia. Thank you so much. Good night. See you guys.